Okay, welcome back to Red Cell Antibodies Part 2. We got a cow Halloween costume for Piggy because Piggy likes eating grass. And it's not like the typical dog that will eat grass then vomit it back up. I've never seen Piggy eat grass and vomit it. She keeps it down. So I think it's a little funny that there's a dog named Piggy, named after a pig, that acts like a cow and is dressed like a cow. So what are we going to talk about in the second part? We're going to review some high yield facts about the RH system, the KEL system, KID, Duffy, and MNS systems. So just as a broad overview, remember that among our non-ABO allo antibodies, you could have IgGs that are generally clinically significant because they bind at 37 degrees at body temp, and they can cause delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions and hemolytic disease of the newborn. You can see IgMs that generally bind at room temperature or lower and are clinically insignificant, generally clinically insignificant. So in general, when you look at a antibody panel, the main IgMs that we worry about are anti-M, anti-N, and your anti-Lewis A and anti-Lewis B. And in general, most of the other antibodies we're concerned about are IgGs. Your things like your RH, Kells, Kids, Duffies, and the big S and little s. Those are your IgG allo antibodies. So starting with the RH system, the five main antigens we're concerned about are D, big C and little c, big E and little e. Keep in mind that there's no little d antigen, there's no little d gene, either have the d gene or not. And with the CE gene, you could have any combination of big and little c and along with big or little e. And of course, these are inherited as a haplotype. So you can get, for example, from one parent, the D gene along with the big C and big E gene. And then from another parent, the other haplotype, you can get, for example, no D gene and then the little c and little e gene as one example. So then you would be positive for all five antigens. So it's worth knowing some of the prevalences for some of these antigens, not for all of them, but some of them are more important than others. It's worth remembering that in the typical donor population in the US, the positivity of D is about 85%, and the positivity for little e is about 98%. And it's worth mentioning the importance of D and the fact that we try to prevent D antibody formation, right? If we can prevent it, we do. And if we happen to have a low inventory of D negative red cells and we have to make hard decisions, we want to prioritize giving the D antigen negative red cells that we do have to D negative females of childbearing potential, right? And this is roughly, say, newborn through age 50. Some books say females of childbearing age. It's not technically correct because even if the patient was a three-year-old female, you would still want to avoid causing an antibody to be formed in such a patient because of memory B cells, right? Even though she's not of childbearing age, she's of childbearing potential, and that same three-year-old when she's, say, 33, will still have that same anti-D. So we want to prevent that from happening. And D is very immunogenic. That's how this evolved. That's how we included the D antigen status on the ABO typing because it's very immunogenic. It's very likely to cause an antibody response. And also because anti-D is the most common cause of a severe hemolytic disease of the fetus or newborn. Severe meaning requiring intrauterine transfusion. Okay, weak D. About 1%, less than 1% of the population is weak D. And we only do weak D testing for blood donors and for neonates to mothers who are D negative. And we'll explain why in a second. And we would do weak D testing in those populations only if we use an anti-D reagent as the first step, and that's negative, right? And so once that's negative, we gotta do another step to distinguish, is this patient truly D negative or are they weak D? So we do weak D testing by adding to that same tube some AHG, some anti-human globulin. And the reason there is if the patient is truly D negative, adding this additional AHG 
won't do anything. The patient will still be, or excuse me, the donor or the neonate will still be D negative. But if the donor or the neonate is weak D, then a, they'll have a negative result when we use the anti-D reagent that will become positive when we use AHG. When we add AHG, then we could stamp that donor or that neonate as weak D. And then for all practical purposes, they're actually going to be stamped as essentially D positive when we label the donor or we do the typing of the neonate, right? Because the reason for this is we don't want to label a donor as D negative unless they're truly D negative, right? We don't want any D antigen of any description to be infused into a D negative recipient. Similarly, for a neonate, we want a D negative neonate to only be called that if there's truly no D antigen of any description. And if they're weak D, that will influence the decision to give the D negative mom Rogam or not. Okay. So why these two populations? The main point is we only want to call D neg donors who are truly D neg. And if they're weak D, we want to just label them as D positive for the purpose of being a donor. And then for neonates, it's worth knowing if you're the obstetrician that if mom is D neg, if fetus is, or excuse me, if baby is weak D because that can influence their decision to give Rogam to protect against anti-D formation or not. So an implication of all that that we discussed is that the risk of a weak D donor causing anti-D in a D negative recipient is certainly lower than it would be if a D positive donor those red cells, if those were infused into the D negative recipient, but it's not zero, right? It's still worth preventing. And this is just a uh, curiosity that happens sometimes if you work in a blood donor center. Sometimes you'll have a blood donor yell at you because they insist that they're D negative, right? They insist that, for example, they're O negative, but then when the donor center does the typing, it comes out O positive. And so how is it that you can be D negative as a patient, but then be typed as D positive as a donor? And the reason for this is because we don't do weak D testing. We don't add that second step of AHG for the typical patient, right? In the patient setting, we don't do that. But in the donor setting, we do add the AHG and we can pick up the weak D that we then label as D positive. So what are the most common haplotypes in the RH system? So don't be bothered by this busy table. The main things that are worth knowing are that number one, the four most common haplotypes in the RH system are R1, R2, R0, and little r. And what do we mean by R1, R2, R0, and little r? What we mean is R1 if it's capital, if it's a capital R, it tells us that there's the D antigen present. And then if it's lowercase, little r, then there is no D antigen. So that's the first fork in the road. And then the number or letter tells us about the C and E antigens. If there's a number one, as in R1, that tells us that this first position, if you call the C position one and the E position two, if there's a one, it tells us that the one position is capitalized, that there's a big C antigen. And if there's two, that tells us that there's a big E, the second position is capitalized. And if it's R0, that's telling us neither one of those is capitalized, so there's just little c and little e. And if there's RZ, a letter, both of those are capitalized. So there's both big C and big E. Similarly, for the little r's, if there's an r prime, one prime tells us that the c is capitalized, and the r double prime tells us that the e is capitalized. And then similarly, if there's a letter, ry means both are capitalized. And then little r doesn't have a zero byte. You could just say little r, and that's telling you that because it's little, there's no d, and because there are no numbers, meaning no primes, that there's just little c and little e. So it's worth knowing if somebody says, you know, a cell is R2, R2, 
again, you have one haplotype from each parent, so you have two of those. So it's worth knowing what they mean by uh, R2, R2 red cell. It means that this red cell is homozygous for this phenotype. So they are D homozygous, D positive, little c homo homozygous, and big E homozygous. So they're negative for big C, right? And they're negative for little e, and so on. It's worth remembering what each of these shorthands mean in the haplotypes and vice versa, number one. It's also worth remembering that these four, R1, R2, R0, and little r, are the four most common in the donor populations. And it's also worth remembering that among the D negative haplotypes, that little r is by far the most common. So that nearly all D negative red cells are homozygous, little r, little r. There are some occasional exceptions you might find, a little r, r prime, you know, heterozygote, but I've never seen, for example, a homozygote for a little r prime, r double prime, or ry, right? Those as homozygotes are essentially uh, not seen. And then one last factoid to keep in mind about RH is that in the black population, R0 is the most common haplotype. So that's telling us that the little c and little e antigens tend to be more common in the black population. And more importantly, the big C and big E antigens are more common in the white population compared to the black population. So it is a common occurrence. For example, if you're a sickle cell patient and you're negative for the big C and big E antigens and you receive many transfusions during your life because it's very common for the donor population to be more in the white population. So it's very common for those big C and big E antigens to be infused into a sickle cell patient and for that sickle cell patient to then make anti-big C and anti-big E antibodies. So anti-big C and anti-big E antibodies are commonly formed antibodies in the sickle cell population. Exactly. Kel is a relatively red cell specific antigen and it's even present on red cell precursors. And it's worth knowing that about 9% of the typical donor population is big K positive and about 91% negative. So it's not that big of a deal if you have an anti-big K antibody, we could find big K negative red cells relatively easily, but it's not the case for little k. Little k is 99.8% prevalent. So if you have an anti-little k, then that's pretty difficult to find little k negative red cells. So keep in mind that the KEL system, right, this KEL system includes the big and little k antigens as well as KPA, KPB, JSA, and J. SB, those are rarely seen antibodies because one of them is a very low frequency antigen, so people are rarely transfused with it, and one of them is a very high frequency antigen, so they're, they have the antigen, so they don't make the antibody. And also keep in mind that there's a KX antigen system, and KX is kind of like a supporting structure to your KEL antigens, okay? So KX on the X chromosome, that's different. It's a different system from the KEL system. And I only bring that up because if you lack the KX antigen, if you lack that antigen, then that so-called McLeod phenotype. This is very rarely seen in real life. I've never seen it, but it's often a pimp question. I've answered more questions about McLeod than I've seen McLeod actual patients. And so I bring up KX and distinguish that from KEL because if you lack KX, you have decreased KEL antigen expression. It's not zero, it's just decreased. It's different from KEL null, the absence of KEL antigens. KX just means you don't have that supporting structure, so your expression of your KEL antigens is decreased. And you can see acanthocytes on the peripheral smear in McLeod phenotype. It's also associated with CGD, chronic granulomatous disease, and also many neuromuscular abnormalities. A deletion at the KX gene site often overlaps with other deletions.
And then just to mention a few words about delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions and to integrate that with what we talked about in the transfusion reaction talk. Remember that KID antibodies are notorious for dipping below the limit of detection. They don't typically do it, but among the antibodies that do it, they're first on the list. And then second on the list is Duffy. So your Duffy antibodies can also be notorious for dipping below the limit of detection and leading to delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. And then of course any IgG can cause delayed hemolytic reactions. So a few words about KID. KID is a urea transporter. So this is a urea transporter B. And so I only bring that up because if you have a person that's Kel null, right, they don't have any KID antigens, you know, if they're double negative, then they are less able to transport urea in and out of the red cell. So a, a difficult trivia question could be, you throw some patient red cells into a high concentration urea and they're not lysed, meaning the urea is not transported through, that is a functional hint that the patient lacks JK, so they're JK null. Again, not high yield, but sometimes it's a trivia question. And then Duffy, it's worth remembering that there is a Duffy-3 antigen. So if a patient lacks Duffy-3, then it's kind of like they're missing the supporting structure, the starting structure of this. So they generally also are negative for both Duffy-A and Duffy-B. So a patient that has an anti-Duffy-3 antibody, they could only get typically red cells from other Duffy-3 negative, meaning Duffy-3 negative, Duffy-A, and B negative donors. It's also worth remembering that the Duffy antigen is a receptor for Plasmodium vivax. So Plasmodium vivax enters the red cell via the Duffy antigens. So my dumb memory aid is that if you change the BI from vivax to FY, so you have instead of vivax, fivax, it sounds kind of similar. It's goofy, but it, to me it's memorable that, okay, the receptor for Vivax is 5X is the FYs are, is Duffy. So being Duffy negative, being A negative, B negative, will actually confer resistance to infection with Plasmodium Vivax. And then it's also worth remembering one of these prevalence numbers that the phenotype Duffy A neg, B neg is about 68% in the black population, and it's rare in other populations. And it's also worth remembering that Duffy B antigen is poorly immunogenic. So finally, the MNS system. The MNS system is a mixed system because you have anti-M and anti-N, which are IgMs that are alloantibodies, right, that are clinically insignificant. And then you also have anti-big S and anti-little s, that are IgG and that are clinically significant, okay? So they're mixed in that sense. And it's also worth knowing that the M and N antigens are on glycophorin A and the big and little S antigens are on glycophorin B. And it's also worth remembering that there is this U antigen that, you, that was named that way because it was thought to be universal. And going back, U is kind of like the trunk of this tree. It's kind of like the base of this structure. So if you are U negative, if you lack U antigen, then you also are big S and little s negative. So one hint that you might be U negative is if you make both anti big S and anti little s. Anti big S, little s, and anti U, those are all IgGs that are clinically significant. They're clinically significant, can cause delayed reactions and HDN. Whereas your M and N, those are IgM cold reacting alloantibodies that are clinically insignificant. And that's all I have about part two of red cell antibodies. I included this because I was trying to draw with my niece, uh, Piggy, here, and then we noticed that. Actually, she's pretty easy to draw. All you need, really, are two triangles, you know, two triangular ears, kind of a flat tabletop head, right? And then this, we noticed, looks a lot like a Mickey Mouse face. So a Mickey Mouse head as her face, all you need is two triangles and Mickey Mouse, and you have Piggy.
So enough about Piggy. Remember to do the quiz questions, make sure you have paid attention and learn something.